Let's start with a general introduction. Who is Omar al-Alama? So His Excellency Omar Sultan al-Alama has been appointed as the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence following the cabinet reshuffle in October 2017. His resp responsibilities include enhancing the government performance by investing in the latest technologies and tools of artificial intelligence and applying them in various sectors. His Excellency Omar al-Sultan al-Ulama is currently the Managing Director of the World Government Summit. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of Dubai Future Foundation and a WT Managing Director of the Foundation. In November 2017, the UAE government announced selecting His Excellency Omar as a member of the Future of Digital Economy and Society Council at the World Economic Forum. During his work in the Future Department at the Ministry Cabinet of Cabinet Affairs and Future, His Excellency participated in developing the UAE Centennial 2071 strategy that aims to position the UAE as the best country in the world. He also participated in developing the UAE Fourth Industrial Revolution strategy that aims to promote the UAE status as a global hub for the Fourth Industrial Revolution and develop the national economy based on knowledge, innovation, and future technologies. Prior to his appointment, His Excellency worked on developing the UAE Artificial Intelligence Strategy, making it the first such strategy of its kind in the world. We will see in a while what's the global roadmap on that. His Excellency has well worked on several sectors, including banking, telecommunications, private enterprise, and government. We'll see how this worked together in helping him in his current positioning. His Excellency has well worked in, in developing and executing strategies, risk analysis, and, changing manage and change management and scenarios planning. Um, he holds a diploma in project management and excellence from American University of Sharjah. I don't know if we have American University Sharjah in the house. Yes, we do. That's good. Thank you for being here all the way from Sharjah and a Bachelor of Business Administration from American University of Dubai. I hope we have also American University of Dubai. Yes, we do. We have an alumni of American University of Dubai in the house. So after sharing few words about His Excellency, I know that's what we all know from his formal profile. I'd like to start with a question and asking Your Excellency, what would you like to share with your audience tonight that does not exist on your formal platform? something about your biography that's a bit informal and a bit outside of what I would say the written text. Thank you very much for that um, very long and elaborate introduction. I feel old already. Um, one thing that I think most people don't know, I was this close to not having a higher education. So um, at one point in my life, I said, I don't believe in higher education. I finished school and I wanted to drop out. It was some sort of revolt against my parents. Um, I wanted to go to the US, study at Harvard. But uh, for some reason, my mother got cold feet and she told me to stay in the country. Uh, she said, education is the same wherever you go. So I said, okay, if that's the case, I don't want an education. Um, thankfully, I had a good friend of mine who came to, to my house and he said, Let's just go and look at the American University in Dubai. And I said to him, I'm not sure I want to go there. Uh, you know, Going from Harvard to AUD, I don't know if it's an upgrade or a downgrade. I don't want to design any university, but um, I wasn't too keen on that option. And then something happened. Um, I went to the university with him. I liked that it was very close to home. It was a five minute drive. And I thought, you know, what's too bad about that? Uh, I can come into university for, in five minutes. The thing I got from university, I think the knowledge that you get is actually very valuable, but because it was very close to home and because it was convenient, I was able to do other things on the side. So focusing on two things specifically, I had a full-time job while working uh, in the university. So I used to work from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
and then go to university from around 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, and take also weekend courses. I also started a business on the side. So I would say maybe the thing that shaped me the most is just that I had enough time or not. I'm not sure if I had time, but I had the drive to actually do more than one thing. Uh, that's one thing that's not on my CV, if you'd like to add it. I think I could look around the room and see certain people with the same passion in here. Um, I know that we currently, because of the placing of AI in the world and the buzzword at the moment is AI, artificial intelligence, you could see that there is a global race toward AI. We have started 2017 with only mere five global or national strategies of AI. At the moment, uh, the land uh, scape, as you can see, is huge when it comes to AI. Why would UAE choose this agenda, AI, to be the first agenda to be executed for UAE 2071 strategy? Thank you for the question. Uh, before answering this question, I would, I would actually want to take you on a journey. Um, when I was young, I kept looking at the landscape. I kept looking at the region and asking myself, what is the reason for our stagnation when other regions actually progressed? And I actually say this quite often. The question was very, I think, deep. It was philosophical. And um, if you look at history, the region was actually very advanced compared to the rest of the world. And I'm talking about from the year 813 till the year 1200, we were the most advanced region on the planet. Then suddenly something happened and we became, I would say the dark ages actually loomed over the region for a long period of time. The answer actually was very simple. It was not adopting to technology, not embracing the ambiguous. So through my research, I found that in the year 1283, if I'm not mistaken, and you can please check the date, the printing press was invented. And the first thing that our region did, the Muslim Khalifat at the time did, was they banned the printing press. They said the printing press is going to be used to print material that is going to harm Islam, going to harm, let's say, the values of our culture. And we don't think that this is the right technology for us to embrace. When we did that, the European, uh, let's say, uh, landscape adopted and absorbed that and said, we believe that this can be used to spread knowledge and for us to progress as a region. In that 300-year time span or 200-year time span, the Arab region went backwards 700 years in development compared to Europe. And the main reason for that is because in our region, if you wanted to access some piece of literature or some piece of uh, knowledge, you'd have to ride a horse or a camel for thousands of miles, go into that library in Baghdad that has that book, read it while you're there, take your notes, get on your camel, ride thousands of miles until you go back and you actually do something useful with it. In Europe, you can just print a copy, take it home, and use it for whatever you please. So if the reason for our stagnation was not adopting technology, then the reason for our development in the future would be adopting technology. It's a simple equation. If we look at our lives today, what abilities do we have as humans? Every single one of you has abilities that every king in history has dreamt of. You have the ability to change darkness into light by clicking a button. You have the ability to access the world's information by clicking a button. You have the ability to talk to anyone anywhere on earth by clicking a button. And today you can actually see that person as well. If we went to, you know, Napoleon or any one of the great, let's say, kings of the past, and we told them that we have this ability today, they think we're crazy. They'll actually, you know, call us either wizards or, or magicians. And all of this power that you have, all of the abilities you have are because of two things. And a simple equation. Energy plus X. So energy plus glass equals light bulb that lights up every piece of darkness. Energy plus a tablet equals a laptop 
that allows you to access everything on Earth in terms of knowledge. Energy plus a phone equals a smartphone that's able to process, compute, and communicate with people across the planet. Now, this equation was right for the last 100 years. So most of the companies that actually changed our lives were companies that believed in this equation. They added energy to something, whether it's to computers or computing, whether it's even something like a carpet, they created treadmills and gym equipment, whether it's to a toothbrush, they created the electric toothbrush that some of you might not be able to live without. So the fact of the matter is, if that was the equation of the past, what is the equation of the future? And the equation of the future is AI or intelligence plus X. We as a country, if we want to be a part of the future, we need to develop the thing that's going to change the future. If everything around you is smart, if everything around you understands uh, you as a person, understands your needs, is able to collect data and improve, then our lives are going to be much better. So our leadership believes in that 100%. And that was the reason for appointing a minister, someone who is senior in government, to actually run this show. But it's not going to be simple or easy. I think uh, AI is something that requires years of actually perfecting. There is no single person on earth that knows this technology in and out. Every person knows a domain of it. So there are experts on, for example, a specific type of assistant artificial intelligence uh, systems, for example. But this person might not understand other elements of it. So it's the right time for us as governments to come on board and nurture this technology to be a part of this future, to ensure that every single one of you can live a better life because of artificial intelligence. Instead of hearing about the Terminator scenario or how robots are going to destroy jobs and you know, displace you guys, why don't we use artificial intelligence to create better opportunities for you? Why don't we use this technology to ensure that government services are not 10 but 50 years ahead? Why don't we give you the service before you even ask for it? And this is a potential. You don't need to go to a government service center, wait two hours in the queue to go and renew your passport. That's 1950 or 1940. Why do we still do it? So this is the ambition that we want to go to. And this is what the leadership is, is looking at. I would like to just add one uh, maybe angle to this. Um, when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Rashid Al Maktoum appointed me, one of the reasons why he said he thought I was the right person was because I am optimistic about artificial intelligence, but I'm cautious as well. I believe that every technology is positive or negative. So when I spoke to His Highness, he said, the reason why you were put in this position is because I know that you are unbiased, and this is how governments should be. Governments should not lean to the left or to the right. They shouldn't say, yes, we believe in the opportunities and ignore the risks, or AI is bad and not look at the opportunities. So it's important for us to look at the technology and any technology with that lens. A car can be used to take us from one place to another conveniently. It can also be used by terrorists to trample people like what happened in France and in the US. And you know, no one can say that the car technology is actually bad, so it's great. It's polluting the environment, yes, to some extent if it's a petroleum car, but there are opportunities as well, the goods, the logistics, etc. So we need to definitely look at the technology from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. So getting from that outlook and to 2016, where we saw the race, the global race towards, in the, in the economic forum, the global economic forum, we said the global race towards identifying what is exactly the fourth industrial revolution, there's a huge question mark. And then I think the question marks were, was resolved by saying artificial intelligence. Okay, it's the key word, the buzzword, everybody's going for it. And then we created a future, a different type of a future where you highlighted through Q&A and the forum to understand what is exactly the future jobs that will be created? What is the landscape of industries that will be created? We're, you, we're looking into a landscape we will have around 50 billion devices in 2020, and then we'd have uh, different, uh, in, in 195 countries, which maps to 2 million uh, 57 devices per country. And is this exactly the artificial intelligence we're looking for? Is it only the race towards 
having an excellence in, in, in technologies developed or is it the value that this technology will provide? We look at, for example, uh, UAE where we were uh, 10 uh, ranks behind in, in, in the global competitive ranking to whatever we have at the moment, which is the 10th at the moment. I would say moment. top 10. Yeah? Top 10 <laughs> ranks behind, but actually exactly. among the best countries. And, and now just because the UAE government chose social media as a way of interacting with the citizens and chose the fact that they should focus on tolerance and happiness and, and different and tangible elements, that it's difficult to have a technology build a tangible kind of analysis or a measurement analysis around around these elements. Um, so I think it's really important right now for all of us in the audience to understand what is exactly the UAE artificial intelligence strategy. What are the major highlights? How would this strategy help UAE become an industrialization kind of power in the world? when it comes not only to the UAE government, but to the current existing industry. We are, we are a country of 3 million people absorbing additional 6 million people. So we already have an advantage. We have the world coming to UAE. So how can we maximize this benefit into building a leading educational institutes, reshaping education, reshaping industry, reshaping governments into the new millennium or the new... Uh, the new era of, of, of the future. So what's, what's in the strategy and the highlight of the artificial intelligence uh, kind of ministry that would help us get there? Thank you for that elaborate question. Um, I think Dubai itself is 3 million uh, people. So the, the population is actually much bigger. Just if I'm going to take your question in phases, let's talk first about jobs of the future and talk, talk about as well your roles in the future. If you look at every single thing you learn in your life, there are two types of, let's say, skills when it comes to progressing in your life. You, you're either heuristic or algorithmic. And to put this in layman terms, heuristic means you're able to think creatively. You have, let's say, ways of approaching problems differently, so critical thinking, so on and so forth. An algorithmic is following a specific set of processes. If you look at the jobs of the future, and if you look at the abilities of artificial intelligence today, it's catered mostly to the algorithmic field. So if you are a lawyer, a doctor, and you know your thought process is, if this happens, then this uh, is what I do, you will have, I would say, a less bright future compared to uh, the rest of the people. I don't mean to offend doctors here. But um, I think the way that the future is going to change, these systems can go through processes much better than us as humans, much faster than us as humans, and are able to learn so their memory is better, the processing power is better. So there's no way we can compete. If you are heuristic in your thinking and your approach, you can come up with an angle that the system would never see you would be a part of the future because the future would need more people that think in that specific way. Now, you might ask me what happens to doctors and lawyers. And uh, this is a question that most doctors and lawyers ask me. The answer, simply put, is doctors and lawyers will always exist. We need them in our lives. But they need to be more enabled by understanding what artificial intelligence is. They, they need to be the people that are developing these systems, not the people that are diagnosing us. Uh, diagnostics is becoming much better on the AI side. So um, we are, this is confidential. I hope you guys don't actually, uh, this, you know. Okay, press are outside the room already. Okay, so so we are um, working on a system, and I won't discuss which disease because it's confidential. We are working on a system that is able to diagnose specific diseases that cost our government millions and millions of dirhams much better than any doctor on earth. This has been proven, it has been validated. Uh, the accuracy rate is 95%. This will only get better with time. Uh, as these systems get more and more training data, as these systems work more and more, they're going to get better. So it starts with one type of disease. IBM Watson does a great job with skin cancer, for example. It's at 85% or so. 
there are still challenges because when you talk about 85%, there's still a 15% rate of false positives with the technology. But you can see the potential. If we're starting at this point here and now, and this is the capability, in 10 years, it's going to be 99% better than any doctor on earth. So diagnostics is no longer what doctors need to do, need to do no matter what field you're looking at. Doctors have to reinvent themselves to be the developers of the tools that are used to diagnose people. So that's how doctors, I think, will remain relevant. Doctors should be the people that are researching the medicines and things we need in the future. If you are part of the heuristic, let's say, group of people, your future seems to be brighter. You'll be able to critically think your way through different challenges. You'll be able to develop these systems in the right way. And I think when it comes to jobs of the future, I've worked on many strategies in the past. Many people ask me, what are the jobs of the future? And I must say that we cannot forecast this. Anyone who says that they can is either from the future or, or a liar. I'm, I'm not sure I trust him. Because if you asked someone 18 years ago, in, 20, in the year 2000, what are the jobs of the future? They're going to say web developers. Websites are very important. If you don't know how to develop a website, you're not part of the future. How many of you know how to develop websites? Yeah, the rest are still part of the future. You know, every person has a job. Every person is able to deliver in terms of the future. What we are seeing right now is there's a shift in jobs. We're moving from jobs that are very process-oriented to social jobs. Social media influencers are super popular. They are able to influence people, and they're getting paid handsomely. Physiotherapists today are one of the most in-demand uh, professions because people are always sitting. They're stationary most of the time. They have issues with their backs, with their legs, with their necks, and they need someone to support them in that. I think as we go along, the nature of jobs is going to change. So if you are agile, if you have the mindset that allows you to actually leverage on this, you have a future. So that's when it comes to future of jobs. Uh, when it comes to government, it's important for us to see the advantages that we have in the UAE for having this position, for having this vision. Every government on earth, if you see every single strategy that was put down, is a strategy that focuses on three pillars. We're going to attract the talent, so we're going to put incentives to do that. We're going to enable the ecosystem, which will allow these companies to thrive, and we're going to fund. But no one talks about policies. Because at the end of the day, what's going to protect you guys when the AI revolution comes to become you know, mainstream is the policies. Should this technology harm you, yes or no? Uh, should we deploy the system, yes or no? And I draw a, a similarity to climate change. The development of cities and countries unresponsibly created climate change. The US developed, Europe developed, and the climate was affected. Today we see China and India developing and we're putting the brakes and saying, no, no, if we go above two degrees, this is what's going to happen, the world can't go back. And then they ask, why did you did not look into that when you were developing and why are you hindering our development? The same will happen with artificial intelligence. If policies are not put today to ensure that this technology is developed responsibly, to ensure that this technology does not harm every single one of you, we're going to have the same issue of climate change coming out of artificial intelligence and other systems of the future. The final point I'd like to make is in the year 2014, the number of transistors that were produced on every factory on Earth was 240 billion billion transistors. I'm going to put that number into perspective. That's more than the grains of sand on Earth. That's more than the number of stars in the visible universe. That number is huge. What that represents is as we progress, and that was in 2014, so I think the number is much bigger now. As we progress, computing and communication is being embedded in everything around us. The new trend is going to be a trend of perceived computing, where computing is available everywhere, around us, everything can compu compute, everything can analyze, everything can communicate, everything can you know, react to us, but without us actually knowing that it can. So the floors, the tables, you know, our clothes, etc. And in that future, the government has to play a big role because 
there is a reason why we live in countries with governments. Governments have our best interests at hand. Um, so we need to ensure that we are forward-looking, our policies are agile, we're able to react to these changes, and we are able to have the best interests of our citizens at hand to ensure that this development does not harm them. So that's a responsibility. Uh, we have Dr. Mataz Al Barwani. He is handling the HPC in NYU Abu Dhabi, and he keeps on keeping and insisting on all of us how important it is to face out old technology and put in new technologies and keeps on pressuring us on the budget of these things. And I think it's important for us when you build this kind of AI operational environment to think, I might use a technology today that's obsolete and too months or obsolete and in three months how can i keep up with this is it really important for us before we adapt a certain technology to build what we call a test bed kind of environment where we can really test how efficient are these technologies in addressing all of the issues that you have mentioned climate change water food security whatever ai elements that we put into the platform to serve the community and when we build that kind of a test bed environment, how can we address ethical issues of, of what you've just mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, self-driving cars uh, being tested on operational road before the full uh, cycle of development is being well developed and uh, on operational roads where you have also normal cars that we know right now, what kind of regulations or rules we have to put this? So my, my question is how important it is to establish proper test bits. And are we going to have that in UAE on a larger framework? So with regards to your f the first part of your question, um, our motto in the Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence Office is brain. So everything we do, we look at it with the, the word or the uh, acronym brain which is building a responsible artificial intelligence nation. Responsible development for AI and responsible use for AI is what's going to either make the citizens and the leadership happy with where we're going with this or get people to revolt against it. So that's our, let's say, guiding star. Now, when it comes to uh, technologies and jumping on every new technology or you know taking a back seat, I must say that in this debate, I actually sit in the middle. I believe that opportunities come, the world develops. We need to ensure that we understand what's coming and what are the opportunities. We need to also test. So we shouldn't wait for others to test these technologies. We should actually be uh, a big part in testing them. And at the same time, if it makes sense for us, deploy it. If, let's say, they say self-driving cars are going to eliminate all accidents on the roads and the technology is ready today, I'm an advocate for you know, stopping every single car on the road and making them all self-driving today. But the technology itself is not ready. And I'm willing to debate anyone who says that, that it is. The technology, it is uh, it's, uh, the technology as it is today is based mostly on sensor technology that uses reflective, let's say, um, mediums to understand its surroundings. If every car and every you know sidewalk actually uses the same technology, whether it's LiDAR, sonar, or something else, there might be some issues. So we have never tested cars in this environment before where every other car is self-driving. There are also issues where, you know, the, the computer vision algorithm in the car has a, let's say, false warning rate where, you know, if it sees something and it's not sure that this thing is something that it should or should not crash into, it can actually proceed in the way that it wants to proceed. So that's what happened with the Uber self-driving car. Uh, issue that happened a few months ago. The car knew that there was a person, but there was this 10%, let's say, margin that it had, and it took it. It said, I don't think it's a person, I don't think it's an issue, and it crashed into that woman and killed her. So sometimes the technology is not ready, but we understand that this is where the future is heading. So we need to play an active role in ensuring that we are part of the development of this technology. We are not just bystanders that take this technology and you know buy it and use it. Um, then will be irrelevant when it comes to the future. We need to be a part of the sediment that the future is built on. Now, we tend to jump on things because we get excited, but His Highness Sheikh Mohammed sat with us a few uh, months ago 
And he said, I believe that when we look at the impact of certain things, we most of the time look at the economic impact. So this is a savings. This is what, you know, a return we can get from doing this. And he said, I don't believe that we should only look at the economic. We should look at the societal angle of it. We should look at the security angle of it. We should look at the angles that matter to the people as well. You know, if the economy is doing well, it's great for the government. But maybe you as individuals feel like you're losing jobs or your life is not as efficient as you want it to be. So His Highness Sheikh Mohammed created something called the Mohammed bin Rashid Center for Accelerated Research to do this specifically. Self-driving cars, great technology. Tell us what the societal impact is going to be on every single citizen in the UAE. Tell us what the security flows are. You know, if, if every car can be hacked or at least 10% of the cars can be hacked, you can create trauma on the roads. So it's important to test, yes, but it's important as well to research the angles that most people are not seeing. Um, I hear a lot of people come to me selling me the idea of AI is ready or self-driving cars are ready. And my response is, I believe it will be ready someday, but it needs some work. When it comes, final point I'd like to make, when it comes to AI, uh, most people talk to me about the amazing abilities of artificial intelligence. And I am one of the people that believe that this technology is amazing. But the best AI system on earth, and I don't know if anyone has this answer, has how many connections? 10,000? Does anyone have the answer? So based on my surveys, it's between 1,000 to 10,000 connections. So the neural network that actually allows the system to take these amazing decisions has between 1,000 to 10,000 connections. And it's able to do everything that we're seeing it able to do now. A slice the size of a sesame seed from the brain of a mouse has 1 billion connections. So, and this is not a human brain. So, I believe that we're cutting ourselves short and not actually believing in our potential. We are enabled by these technologies and we are able to use them to, you know, develop further. When the internet came, it gave us access to knowledge. Today, you guys have more knowledge every single one of you, so, you know, regardless of what your background is, you have more knowledge than the greatest thinkers of history. So, if, you know, you sit with Leonardo da Vinci, he has a lot of knowledge on engineering, he has a lot of knowledge on art, but you guys understand the human body much better, you understand, you know, many different elements of our lives as, as human beings better than these great thinkers. It's because you have access to knowledge. So when it comes to AI, if it optimizes our lives in the same way, you guys will be 100 times better as well. So we'll be looking at our lives today and say, this is how we used to live without the internet. This is how we used to live without AI. Um, I tend to believe that the government should really test this technology and try to adopt it in a way that serves the citizens responsibly. Thank you. Um, I've heard you once upon a time discussing how important it is to establish uh, an AI council to just get together what's the global strategy when it comes to AI and not to work on silos when it comes to building an AI kind of strategy. And I love your reference when it comes to the biology uh, example that you've given because uh, we've run into discussions with our provost who is... Uh, from that kind of sector, from the science sector. And uh, on several occasions, he challenged us, can you make sure that the technology you're building is resilient, is self-healing? Because a human body is self-healing, but is you, are your technologies that self-healing? So how important it is to have these kind of different perspectives when you build the uh, AI council coming from experts all around the world, not only from people who are excellent and who are masters in, in deep learning or machine learning, but also uh, scientists when it comes to, to biology, to come to when it comes to chemistry, to, when it comes to the different fundamental scientific disciplines as well. So the example I used, um, for those of you who haven't heard it before, I don't believe that artificial intelligence is the biggest threat in the short term. And this is a controversial statement for me to make because I'm contradicting some great thinkers, but... I believe that AI might be a threat if it's used in the wrong way, uh, maybe 20 or 30 years down the line. But today, you can buy a $10 kit 
that will allow you to manipulate genetics and create a virus or a disease that is far worse than the plague and can kill half of humanity in your backyard. This technology exists today. You can actually buy a $10,000 piece of equipment that allows you to edit it even farther beyond. You can create anything you want in your lab. So every technology, as we said, is good and bad. And I think if you scan the horizon, there are specific technologies that are developing in a way that is not regulated, which is scary. So AI is not that yet. The people who understand AI are very limited. So that's why we are a bit lucky that not every single person can develop a killer AI that will, you know, uh, harm us. Now, with regards to the council, we have multiple councils. So we have something called the UAE Artificial Intelligence and Blockchain Council, which includes member of the, members of the federal government and the local government in every single emirate to talk about how we can ensure that the development of AI in the UAE is holistic. It's not just Dubai or Abu Dhabi uh, progressing. It's not just the federal government uh, progressing. Every single one of you should see a change that impacts their lives positively through this council. The other thing we did is we created something called the Global Artificial Intelligence Governance Forum, which is, I think, the council that you're mentioning. And that brought together more than 200 experts, philosophers, um, you know, pioneers in AI, ministers, and others, international organizations, to draw a roadmap for governments on how they should govern AI, because no one has the answer, as we discussed before. Every person has a specific stream that they understand. Every country is pushing in a specific direction. But when it comes to holistically looking at governing this technology, no one has an answer, no, not one person. So... The outcomes were great. And I think these are not outcomes that we want to just keep for the UAE. We need to ensure that this is sent out to the globe to ensure, as we said, that we develop this technology responsibly, that this technology does have a positive impact on the lives of every single individual on Earth, not just Emiratis, not just Canadians, not just Chinese, not just Americans. So, uh, you know, the momentum is being built. Uh, we have signed a multilateral agreement with India we're signing a few others in the next uh, coming months to ensure that these countries can be a part of this coalition and that we can push towards this notion of responsible development rather than just for profit development or for, for let's say, singular benefit development. Thank you. This is a positive news for me, I guess. Um, so next on our agenda is this, the UAE government of the future. So we have four major categories of the strategies that's been built for the UAE government, for the future of UAE government. And I'd like to ask you, being part of the team who highlighted the next 100 years of UAE in 2071, what kind of opportunities and challenges and gaps that a youthful government would face when they highlight the next 100 years of the future? So... I was lucky to be in an environment where I was given this opportunity. Um, being able to shape the next 100 years or the next 50 years um, of your government is something that most people dream of. So I'm thankful for being in that opportunity. When you look at the future, the future is something that becomes more and more blurry as you, know, you look further. So many of you can actually forecast, if I ask you right now, can you forecast the next year? Many of you can actually give me a decent forecast. It might not be right, but you might be confident that you can. If I ask you to forecast the next five years, it gets a bit more blurry. If I ask you to forecast the next 10 years, more blurry, so on and so forth. But what remains is if the leadership puts a vision that is aspiring enough, you'll be able to build generations that aspire to achieving that vision. And that's what the UAE Centennial Plan is. We don't have all the answers, and no one does. But we understand that if we want to become the top nation on Earth, there are specific pillars that are very important. We have to have the right society. We have to have the right mindset. Our culture should be a growth mindset culture. We should enable talent. We should attract them. We should do X, Y, and Z. So there are things that are going to be fundamental for any country even a thousand years from now. 
And that's what we're focusing on. The other thing is, if we look at the progress of the UAE in the last 50 years, so by 2021, we'll be, it'll be our 50th anniversary. Uh, 50 years ago, we had very few college graduates, I think uh, less than 100. We did not have any institutions, uh, educational institutions in the UAE. We didn't have roads, so you know we had dirt roads. We didn't have a proper economy that was built on a circular model. And in 50 years, our leadership were able to take us from that to a country that is going to Mars, to a country that is seen among the top countries on Earth, to a quality of life that most people envy us on. And that was done because specific ind individuals from our leadership had a vision. That's all they had. They believed that we will have the best education institutions. They believed that we are going to have the right culture. They believed that we're going to invest in the people. And some people actually challenge this and they say, no, but you guys had money. My counter argument is Libya has a lot more money than the UAE. Libya has more coastal land than the UAE. It's, I think, 10 times uh, the coastal land that we have. So for tourism, they're much better than us. Libya has more Roman artifacts and Roman ruins than Italy. So, you know, Libya is the right country for, you know, for this progress. But you see the different state of these two countries. The answer is not resources. Resources is an enabler. It's actually vision. So when it came to the centennial plan of the UAE, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed both believed that if we set a vision that is bright enough, all of us will rally behind it. If we put, let's say, fundamentals that are going to be there even 100 years down the line, we're always going to improve and we're always going to progress. So that was the, the motive behind building the Centennial Plan. There are gaps. And I think the biggest gaps we have are in the human. Because any strategy on Earth or any vision on Earth is met if the people are enabling themselves to be a part of this future. If the people, you know, arm themselves with the right skill sets. If the people are as productive as, you know, the government hopes for them to be. So we have no lack of determination. We have no lack of resources. What we lack today is, I think, the universal drive of the population. But that isn't actually negative. If we look at the percentage of the population that are aligned with our leadership, it's around 99%, or maybe 100%. So when His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid says AI, everyone works towards AI. And that's a unique feature of the UAE. And I think that's what's going to drive us to even achieving more than what we have in terms of our vision. If, you know, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed says, I believe that we're going to export the last barrel of oil and celebrate, instead of people saying, you know, why are you celebrating that we export our last barrel of oil? Everyone's actually celebrating this and saying, yes, we want to reduce our dependency on oil. We want to be a part of the future. We want to be the drivers that take us there. So I, I really believe that this vision is achievable. I really believe that you know, we'll have challenges along the way that we can overcome because the humans that we have here, the citizens of the UAE, the residents of the UAE, are people that can overcome any challenge. When it comes to putting this strategy down or any strategy, the blurrier it gets, so the more long-term it is as a vision, the more you need to look at the fundamental truths of the future. So in physics, you look at first principles. You do that as well when you look at setting a vision for a country. What are the principles that will not change even a thousand years from now? Certain things we understand will not change. Put that first and then work backwards. So this centennial plan is one that's going to keep being reviewed. It will be updated and it will be our continuous north star that takes us towards where we want to go. Okay, so now, what about your vision when it comes to future government? What do you think a future government should look like as Omar Sultan al ulama And what would be the roadmap to accelerate our base towards that direction? Interesting question. Um, so I think... The future government depends on what future you're talking about, whether it's 
five years or 50 years. But I believe that if we're going to look at, let's say, first principles or the fundamentals of the future, the government needs to be a driving force for the economy, but not the main investor when it comes to the economy. The government should be an enabler. So the private sector should be that. I do believe that through AI, we can ensure that our policies are cutting edge. We can ensure that our government understands the different variables and that we are able to take the right decisions. So uh, has anyone here attended the World Government Summit this year, 2018? Anyone else? Oh, two. Okay. So, or three. So in the World Government Summit this year, we showcased our vision for the AI advisor to ministers. So currently what happens is the minister comes into the office and he attends meetings, he sets directions, he takes decisions, they might be right or wrong. Um, there, is a, there is a chance in the future that the horizon scanning, the impact analysis, all of this will be done you know, in a second by a smart agent. That agent would raise, let's say, um, possible options or possible things or initiatives that the minister can do, and he can choose. So he is the ultimate decision maker, but this agent will tell him, you know, if we do this policy, this is the impact, do you want to do it or not? And then the second thing is, when it comes to the lives of citizens, and we're talking about the future of governments, the leveraging of any technology or the, the forecast of any future should be based on making your lives simpler. So it's about convenience, it's about value, getting more value for your time, more value for your money. Uh, and that can be seen in a very simple way. As I discussed before, there is no need for you to visit any government service center, I think, in the future. You will get everything you need to get without even you know requesting for it. It will come to you before you get it. While you're sitting and enjoying, for example, your favorite show or reading your favorite book. Why would you have to actually get out of your way, get inconvenienced, drive half an hour, wait two hours in the queue to get one service? So I think that's the first fact of the future. It's convenience and it's value. The second is tailoring everything to every citizen. So Facebook has more data on every single one of us than anyone on earth. I think Facebook knows us more than our spouses, more than our parents. And it's because we use Instagram, we use WhatsApp, we use you know, Facebook, and it generates a lot of data. If the government was optimized, it will be able to mine, I wouldn't say as much data, but a lot of data as well, because you can choose to you know, uninstall WhatsApp and Facebook and Instagram, but you can't choose to uninstall the government. You know, the government is something that you'll always deal with. So if we collect the right data from citizens to ensure that these data are, uh, sets are anonymized and, you know, or to an extent used and, and we understand what you guys want, we can deliver your requirements before you ask for it. And I think that's the future of government. The future of government is proactive service delivery, proactive improvement of life, not reactive. We shouldn't wait till things become bad before we say this is a policy or before we say this is what we're going to do or this is an initiative. So I think the future is going to be proactive rather than reactive. And it's going to be built on data that's mined from every single individual. So how can we get there? That's the second part of the question. How can we accelerate that? What's your intake around establishing research and development units around UAE? Are we there yet? If you look at other countries in the region or other countries in the world, I'd say we're closer. If you look at the vision of our leaders, we have a long way to go. So there's always this drive to continuously do more. I think we can do a lot more. And we can do a lot more at the grassroots level, really enabling the people to ensure that we lift them up to understand this technology and to understand this future and to be a part of it. We can do a lot more when it comes to prototyping, when it comes to you know doing the uh, different, let's say, test beds that we need to have. We definitely can have a lot more um, think tanks in the UAE. So I, I think there's a lot more that can be done. But our position is much better than other countries, thankfully. Thank you, Eric.